Time Warner Cable has a new suitor, Vox buys Recode, and you won't believe what words just got added to the dictionary. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 345 for Tuesday, May 26, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. Welcome. I am Megan Maroney, and joining us to talk about the tech headlines is Jason Abraziz, business reporter from Mashable. Jason covers media and telecom industries with a particular focus on how the internet is changing these markets and impacting consumers. Welcome back, Jason. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's get to today's big news, which is right up your alley. Charter Communications offered $56.7 billion to acquire rival Time Warner Cable today. Charter is the second largest cable company in the United States, right behind Comcast, whose own bid for Time Warner Cable fell through just over a month ago. What makes Charter think they're going to succeed where Comcast did not? Well, it's an interesting situation where uh, it is a giant deal. Certainly, you know, $57, $58 billion is no, is no small potatoes. But in terms of the companies that it's combining, it's, it's a much smaller deal. Charter uh, is much smaller than Comcast. And it's actually much smaller than Time Warner Cable, uh, meaning this is one of the rare times where you see a smaller company uh, acquiring a bigger one. Uh, they're also going to be buying a, a small Florida television and Internet uh, distributor uh, called Bright House Networks. So even though those three companies are merging into one, they're still going to be far smaller than uh, a combined Comcast and Time Warner Cable, or even a smaller than, than Comcast is on its own. Um, I think that those reasons, you know, the, the companies think that they're going to be able to get this by regulators because they're just not going to be as, as big and powerful in the market as uh, a combined Comcast and Time Warner Cable would have been. Right. So what percentage of the high-speed broadband market does the, would the new charter have if this deal went through? So Char uh, Charter, which the the new company is going to be called New Charter, they got they got pretty crazy with this yeah. one. Um, new Charter would uh, still claims that they would have under thirty percent of the broadband market. Now that that is a is an interesting word these days. We think of broadband as just kind of like regular Ethernet internet that's relatively fast. But the FCC not too long ago changed the definition to a minimum of twenty five megabytes per second. Now that's not as common as, as your typical everyday household internet which is one of the reasons that some of these companies seem to have such an outsized footprint now. All right. And so there's a lot of promises they're making that every, you know that this is going to be great for everyone. Speeds are going to be better. And uh, mm -hmm. so th that's why they're, they're, that's, you know, they it has to be that they're giving something good to us in order to, for them to, you know, for this deal to go through. Uh, but, I mean, are regulators worried more about the cable TV part of this or the internet? Or is it really just one big thing since we're all watching TV on the internet now anyway? I mean, I think particularly in this deal, they're going to be concerned about the internet and the size of the footprint. Uh, you know, cable TV you saw uh, in the past has certainly been a concern and something they're going to keep an eye on. Uh, but particularly is, is that is an industry where not a lot of people are entering the market as customers. Uh, they, they, they don't seem to really care as much. What they care about are, are the newer burgeoning markets, particularly online television which in the last year has gotten, you know, so much more competitive, competitive, and it's just going to get more so. Uh, you know, they want to make sure that they don't do anything to affect that. And, and part of, you know, taking care of that industry is making sure that uh, there's good competition in the broadband industry. And that means trying to limit consolidation when, when appropriate. Right. Well, you write about a statement that Tom Wheeler, chairman of the FCC, has already made that uh, calls into question some aspects of this deal. Tell us about that statement. Yeah, you know, the FCC came out real quick. Uh, I mean, it was in my email inbox, uh, you know, almost as fast as I saw anything else, saying, with a, with a statement from Tom Wheeler saying, like, you can't just say that this isn't going to hurt consumers. You can't say, say that this is like a net negative or, a, a, you know, a neutral deal. This has to show, you know, positive effects for consumers or, you know, we're going to kind of assume that the baseline is that this isn't going to be worth it for us. So it's a pretty, you know, aggressive statement for the uh, you know, the head of the FCC to come out and say, like, you need to prove to us that this is going to be good for consumers. Uh, is, is it that doable? Certainly. But but it, it can be a tough, it can be a tough task. So are you willing to make a wager? Do you think it's going to go through this deal? I think I think it goes through. Uh, I, I really do think it goes through. Th these are relatively small companies. And, and I think, you know, some of the upsides that they can push 
are that, you know, they're hungry, they're smaller, you know, they're trying to be competitors with Comcast. Comcast right now is so big that, you know, they don't really have too many competitors. They can say to themselves, like, you want somebody to try to, you know, push Comcast, like, we can be the guys to do that. All right, interesting. So let's move on. Over the holiday weekend here in the United States, Joni Ive revealed that he has been promoted to chief design officer at Apple. It's a newly created position. Ive has, he was the senior vice president of design and he oversaw design for the iMac, the MacBook, the Air, the MacBook Pro, the iPod, the iPhone, and most recently the Apple Watch. He has over 5,000 design and utility patents to his name and it's fair to say that he's already a pretty big deal over there. What can we learn from this promotion? You know, you kind of have to read the tea leaves on this one. Uh, you know, people who watch Apple and, and, you know, know how these things work kind of think that this could be the beginning of the end for him. This might be, you know, the first step toward the exit. And we're not talking about anytime soon. You know, we're talking about it in a, in a timeline of years. But, you know, he's relinquishing some day-to-day -day duties. He's going to be, you know, bringing on some people. One guy's going to oversee industrial design. The other one's going to uh, oversee interface. He, he might not be as hands-on. And, you know, that can be, you know, how you slowly back out of the company and make sure that, you know, you leave behind people who can keep the company strong and, and doing the kind of, you know, work that Apple's been doing, leading the market, uh, you know, on all these devices. Then again, there's some other people who think that, well, if Tim Cook's out anytime soon, for whatever reason, Johnny Ive could end up in that seat. That's interesting. I mean, you know, I read somewhere, I think he's only 48, um, mm -hmm. but he's been there since 1992, which is yeah. basically forever. I mean, he worked on the Newton um, it's also, I mean, he was hired after Steve Jobs had been ousted. So he wasn't, you know, he's probably been there maybe longer than Steve Jobs and I didn't do the math, but it's interesting that they would, that you think that the tea leaves are saying that they're kind of moving him out because, but I guess we'll have to see. So you say he's not going to be working as much hands-on and so who will be taking over the duties? Do we know? So there's two guys, if you'll, call, let me refer to my notes just so that I'm terrible with these names. <laughs> Richard Horworth is now the head of industrial design department, and uh, Alan Dye will head up user interface. So, you know, these are people that he's been working with for years, that he's helped groom. Uh, you know, that design uh, group is known to be kind of very insular, keep to themselves, they work together very closely, you know, face to face, all seated around a table. So, you know, these are guys that he's, you know, worked with for a long time, developed a relationship with, probably trusts, you know, very deeply. And uh, that's why he's putting him uh, in, you know, some of the biggest spots in, in, in the company. Interesting. So next up, we have a story, sort of a meta technology news story about technology news. Uh, tonight, the New York Times broke the story that Recode, that's the technology news source spun off by, spun off from the Wall Street Journal by Kara Swisher and Walt Mossberg. I think maybe a couple years ago they spun off. Now they're being bought by Vox Media. Uh, Vox owns Verge and then a bunch of other sites that I don't really use, Eater, Polygon, Curbed, um, some other cleverly named sites. What do you think this means? Uh, you know, it's an interesting move. Recode, obviously, only about a year and a half old, but in that time has had an incredible impact on, uh, you know, the tech media world. Uh, it's, it's, you know, one of the sharpest sites. It's got just incredible talent there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we've known for a while that they have struggled to generate a lot of traffic. Uh, you know, Comscore says they're only generating about 1.5 million uniques a month. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty low by almost anybody's standards. They had a pretty, they were, they were a pretty strong uh, conference uh, business, which is helping bring some money in the door. But it did seem that for a while that this company, you know, was in a position where it had a lot of upside, a lot of good things about it. It could bring a lot to an existing media company, which is exactly what it's doing now. But it might have been just a matter of time before something like this happened. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm a huge fan of Kara Swisher. And, you know, she interviewed Obama. She interviewed Hillary Clinton. Like, she gets all these big names. And it was surprising to me. But then when you really think about it, it's, you know, they are a relatively small site. When you look at their numbers, they're small. So are you saying that maybe this was their plan all along? Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think, you know, maybe this didn't happen exactly they wanted it to. It's an all-stock deal. So, you know, Rico's not being, you know, compensated with any cash right out of the gate. Then again, Vox is probably one of the strongest young media companies out there. So, you know, getting in on Vox stock right now is probably not something too many people are upset about. But it did seem like that this was a, you know, we're going to go out our own. We're going we're gonna to try this out. And, you know, their, their aspirations never seemed to be, uh, you know, to be the next Wall Street Journal or, or to try to, you know, take on, you know, major publications. They were kind of happy doing what they were doing, which was, you know, being, you know, you know, the smartest, sharpest people in the room, breaking news, but doing it, you know, their way and not really, you know, going after a lot of traffic, not really trying to do a lot of things to encourage, you know, viral hits. They were kind of like a news person's news site.
right. So let's move on to another story that you had over the weekend about John Nash. He's the Nobel Prize winning mathematician who died in a car accident with his wife on Saturday. Uh, Nash was the subject of the Oscar winning movie, A Beautiful Mind. That's probably where a lot of people know about him. Most mathematicians, of course, know about him through his equilibrium theory. It's been called one of the 10 great ideas of the 20th century. Uh, explain a little bit about the theory and uh, what came before it and, and the game theory. And ex elaborate on that for me. It's a little confusing. Sure, <laughs> sure. And I'll do the best I can with this. Is, is, it is, you know, it's, it's things that are sometimes very simple, but, but you know, very difficult to explain. Uh, and I can't even, and, you know, claim to be an expert. But equilibrium theory is an offshoot of, you know, what's more broadly called game theory, which is kind of just the study of decision-making processes and, and, you know, how they can affect them, each other. Uh, the most famous example is what's called prisoner's dilemma, which is if you arrest two criminals who, you know, committed a crime together, you separate them, and then you ask them, you know, both, you know, you can either uh, confess, you can either stay quiet, or, you know, um, you can just pick one of those two things. And the outcome, you know, changes based on, you know, those choices and what the other person does. So it's all about kind of like this sense of, you know, if I make this decision, but that other person changes their decision, would that change what I want to do? Um, it's, it's kind of very real world and has a lot of economic application. Uh, what, uh, what Nash did was kind of develop this equilibrium theory that was able to take this kind of out of this very like esoteric mathematical world and make it applicable to almost everything. Uh, any, I mean, agriculture, war, uh, you know, politics, uh, economics, all, everybody, you know, studies this now. And it's really become one of the, you know, one of the key things for, you know, almost every academic to have, you know, a base knowledge of. Right. I mean, really interesting in economics, like why, why we make the decisions that we do, why we make the choices. And, you know, it's, it's not all rock, paper, scissors, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, what he did, uh, even though it was particularly uh, amazing, was kind of say that there are optimal solutions for certain problems where people thought that there was no way to figure that out. So kind of being able to say that there's an endpoint had suddenly, you know, taken questions that people thought were unanswerable, which may, basically made them answerable. Right. Well, Jason, thank you so much. Jason Abraziz is the Mashable, Mashable business reporter, and you can find him on Twitter or on Mashable. And we always look forward to you coming on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care. Coming up soon, you'll be able to force touch Cortana on the iPhone, and you won't believe what I'm going to tell you about the dictionary. It might involve dogs that look like babies. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to develop an app, take better photos, improve your memory, or build a new website. lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. How about if your mind isn't feeling so curious? We have all been there, the cursor blinking at you from the empty page like some kind of admonishing reproach. Why not try Creativity Bootcamp to help you flex your creative muscles? Maybe you want to learn a new programming language. Lynda.com has courses on PHP, C++, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, Java, and much more. They also have an innovative series called Code Clinic, where Lynda.com issues a series of code challenges, and authors share their solutions using different programming languages. And they just released four new installments on Swift, C, R, and JavaScript. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along or search for an answer and skip to that point in the video. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2, and we thank them for their support. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Microsoft, we get it. You're open to trying new things. Today's crossover announcement is that Cortana, Microsoft's Siri, Alexa, OK, Google equivalent of a talking desktop assistant, will be coming to iOS and Android in a companion app that will let you sync your mobile phone to your PC even if you have an iPhone or an Android phone. The Verge reports that the phone companion app will work like a hub and direct you exactly where Microsoft wants you to go to download all the Microsoft apps like Skype and OneDrive, OneNote, Outlook, Office, Xbox Music, and Cortana. Live streaming app Periscope launched an Android app today because apparently iPhone users are not the only ones who out there interested in recording their every move and violating the privacy of those around them. 
right through their smartphone. TechCrunch reports that the Android version of Periscope includes a few new perks, including a return to broadcast feature that lets you return to a stream in case you happen to want to use your phone for anything else besides watching someone else eat their lunch. I kid, I know there are plenty of legitimate uses for live streaming apps. It's just that sometimes I find them kind of creepy. Reliable Apple rumor site 9to5Mac reports that the next iPhone, the iPhone 6S, will allegedly include a force touch display with haptic feedback, just like the Apple Watch. I'm a big fan of everything about force touch, with the exception of the name force touch. Also creepy. iOS 9 will allegedly be force touch ready, which will clear up some control space and replace some interactions that currently require the press and hold command. And finally, Miriam Webster took to Twitter today to cleverly announce that they've officially added the word clickbait to the dictionary. That's right. You won't believe what we just added to the dictionary. Sadly, it is not a puppy saving a kitten who's riding on the back of a goat wearing pants or eating a sandwich. Clickbait is among the 1,700 new entries added to Merriam-Webster's unabridged, including net neutrality, photobomb, WTF, meme, and jegging. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash tn2. You can write to us at tn2 at twit.tv. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com. <laughs>